There we go. Hi, this is Neil from Growlies, and uh, we're here with Dr. Marty Goldstein, a uh, world-famous veterinarian and uh, all-around great guy, actually one of my personal heroes. I've been uh, following Dr. Marty as long as we've been doing this, so like 15 or almost 20 years, but you've been around doing good work for a lot longer than that. And, uh, I, I'm a, a huge fan, Dr. Marty, so thank you for joining us. Ah, pleasure, and it's been 47 years, Neil. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You graduated from Cornell University in the 70s uh, as a doctor of veterinary medicine. And um, so what got you started? What made you want to go to become a vet? There was no other choice. I mean, I wanted, I love dinosaurs. So I was thinking about that. My mother wanted me to be a nuclear physicist, but I couldn't pronounce it. So scratch that. <laughs> and then just my love for animals. My brother, who was five years ahead of me, became a veterinarian. And then it just became a no a no brainer because my love for animals. That's awesome. So there's two Goldsteins in the in the business. Yeah, man. That's awesome. <laughs> and so uh, it, and then you were one of the founding fathers of the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. Yes, actually the. Oh, we just lost your sound. No, no, sorry. We can restart. No, I don't know what's going on. Sorry. Do you have any other microphone? Um, like, I don't think you need the earphones. Yeah, no, it's, it's dead. Dead. Oh, there you go. That's it. That's you it. Hear me? Awesome. I can't hear you, though. Oh. How about now? How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can. Okay, and I can hear you. Yeah, I, I get a brand new Mac computer, so. It so looks now you have working great. Sound. It looks like it's working great. I don't see any problems. Okay, good. We're cool. Okay, so we were just, uh, well, I'm just going to leave that in if you're cool with that, uh, or would you rather restart? Oh, no, leave it in. Okay, because yeah. life right exactly so uh so uh, ultimately we were just saying that uh you, you your brother had started in school uh, as, as had gone through as a veterinarian five years ahead of you and yeah. you really have a choice you just followed in the family footsteps essentially yeah it, as i said it just became a a no-brainer for me to want to do that because of my love for animals and you know, that was, that was it. And was it in the 80s you created the AH, AHVMA, that you were one of the founders? Yeah, the, the actual, the, the veterinarian that created it, Dr. Carvel Tekert, he came up to visit uh, my brother and me way back in the early days when we were selling alternative uh, foods in those days to find out about what is this, you know, health movement in our profession. And just joking around to him, I said, you know what we need? We need a, a holistic uh, organization. But we're too busy, Carvel, so why don't you create it? And it was just kidding, and he did. That's awesome. So it's like, it, I, I had the original idea, but he was the one that spearheaded the entire American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. Yeah, it's awesome. It's yeah. and um, I wish we had some some something similar here in Canada. We don't. Um, we all have our provincial veterinary boards. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of time. You know, I, I've been going against the grain since you know the the mid seventies, and it's such a pleasure to my life after all these decades of opposition and threats and ridicule and criticism to actually see the grain is going in this direction. So it's, it's about time, Neil. <laughs> well, they're fighting it. They're fighting it. Yeah, but, but the grain is getting way too strong in the direction of health. Agreed. Agreed. Agreed completely. And so, and the, the fact that we can do this today says that the people who believe in, um, uh, more appropriate or natural approaches to health um, have a voice today. Where we do, 
we didn't 20 years ago. Right. Oh, no. Oh, we didn't. And we had a voice, but it was being stomped upon. Yeah, yeah it really was. Now, you started work with in uh, television. Um, and please, was it Oprah that you had started in television with? No, I, I started because my goodwill was spreading all over the country. I was on like local TVs. I was a regular on Good Day New York, which is more popular in New York City than the other big shows like, you know, Good Morning America. Sure. And I got onto Good Morning America because uh, ABC Eyewitness News ran a piece on me and it got so much uh, response that they then challenged me to make a hopeless case better and film me every two weeks for eight weeks. And the, and the dog did get better. So they had me on with the dog and that led to Good Morning America having me on. And then, you know, I became friendly with Martha Stewart. I was taking care of her dogs. And she gave me, besides me being on her TV show several times, she gave me my own show on Sirius Satellite Radio for six years. Yeah, you did that a long time. And you, you did uh, up until the demise of Sirius or until they amalgamated, right? Oh, no, no, until the demise of Martha on Sirius. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So it was Martha who left Sirius. So it was her channel that went away. Correct. And then Oprah contacted me while I had my, t my radio show with Martha because her dog was kind of in critical shape. And then she flew her dog in to see me, and we made the dog, you know, better. Uh, and then she had me on her show. And it's just, you know, it's been day by day for 40-something years. <laughs> That's all I got to say. So I had it backwards then. I thought you had done Oprah before you did Martha, but it was the other way around. Uh, no, it was the other way around. Yeah, okay. And then um, you wrote a great book in, I want to say, the late 90s, in 99. Is that yeah. correct? And uh, I have a, a few copies of it uh, signed. Thank you very much. Um, and we've been, we give them away occasionally at the store to, to very happy uh, customers um, as a, you know, a, a signed uh, giveaway. You know, we use them as contest things, you know, in the, in the store. And um, um, uh, tell me about that. How, did, how was that received when you brought it out? This natural approach. Yeah, one of the problems that Raymond was, was having with it is that it was being received too well because we know controversy sells. Right. <laughs> and what's great about that book is 20 years later, Amazon ranks over 9 million books. And 20 years later, that book is still in the top 10,000 on Amazon. That's because it's written to be timeless. The good news is I'm more than halfway done with book two. That's awesome. I can't wait for it. That's a, okay, that's this, a this one's going to be a trip. The first book was called The Nature of Animal Healing, and nature has two meanings. The nature in which the body heals, but also nature is the healer, not the doctor. The second book is called The Spirit of Animal Healing, and we're going to take it to a much broader level, and spirit also has two meanings. The spirit in which the body heals, but also the spiritual aspect of our favorite kingdom, the animal kingdom. That's awesome. And we're going to take it more to a global level. And it's just, it's just coming out so well. I have this incredible co-writer from San Diego who is a, an, an animal lover. And we're just combining our efforts so well. I'm getting very excited about it. The manuscript has to be presented uh, January 15th, and then takes almost up to a year to get it on the shelf, which I don't understand, but it does. There's a lot of logistics to work out, I expect, and then marketing plans and all those things, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and so, and, and so you're hoping to be done by the end of the year. you got to get on it. You only have like a, a month and a half. Oh, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, thank you for giving us some of your time. Um, and so you recently had the dog doc come out. Now, I have to admit, I have not yet seen it because it is still in limited showings and it has not come to Victoria. And if there's a way that I can help it come to Victoria, I want to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, it, how can people see it and when can people see it and, uh, you know, all those good things? Well, it, it's at film festivals right now. Yeah. And it's actually winning 
best in film at some of these festivals. So far as we've seen it, it's had 100% positive reviews. And it was, you know, Rotten Tomatoes, which ranks movies. It had a 100% score. Awesome. So it, it really, it, it, you know, it, it was a very dear friend and client of mine of almost 30 years that put her efforts into it. One of her last documentaries, uh, Buck, about the horse whisperer, Buck Ranneman, actually made the short list for the Academy Awards. Wow. So very professionally done. And they filmed over 300 hours or about 300 hours over three years. And a genius editor put an hour and 41 minute film together. And it is truly a work of art. It is, it's a tearjerker. So when you do go, make sure you bring tissues because you'll be crying within the first five minutes. And that'll go off and on for the entire film. But it really drives a point home about the need for alternative therapies and how we have to rethink the box, so to speak. Right. Uh, and, and you have a particular set of tools that you use regularly in your practice, um, like cryotherapy and other things that are cons considered um, or are, are uncommon. And so um, can you approach, tell me about some of those modalities that you use in, in your practice? Well, cryosurgery is a conventional form of surgery. It's just like you said, not well known. Right, okay. And, and you know, it's being done maybe by 10, 15, 20% of the profession, but for minor little skin tags and little tumors. And you'll see it very, very well in the documentary. We've taken it to a much, higher level where dogs with tumors encompassing their entire jaw or i mean you know it, it, it's just it's another level that we've taken it to and other therapies intravenous vitamin c i started to do that way back in the 70s with my brother and you know we're now known as the iv vitamin c therapy hospital but it's has tons of medical verification in the conventional field right now. So acupuncture, mm -hmm. you know, it's really funny. You know, I, I became certified in acupuncture in the mid seventies and that's where the condemnation started. You know, Goldstein lost his mind. He's sticking needles in dogs. And now, you know, it's being accepted and taught in the curriculum of over 50% of the vet schools. That's awesome. So, so many veterinarians are coming to me and saying, oh, you were so far ahead of your time. And my answer is, acupuncture has been around 3,000 years. I wasn't ahead of my time. I was just 30 years less behind than you were. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, well, I had an yeah. English bulldog who um, had hemivertebra and spondylosis, so we could never do chiropractic on her. Um, but uh, she responded very well to acupuncture. She, it's the only thing she would say. Yeah, acupuncture is the gateway for conventional veterinarians to enter the field of alternatives. It, it's the starting point. So many veterinarians are actually interested in acupuncture. And do you use uh, Chinese herbal medicine in your practice? Have well, you ever? Time. You know, Western herbal medicine, Chinese herbal medicine. You know, what's what's Phenomenal now, but also a little scary. When I started to do all of this, there was one supplement in the United States. It was a multivitamin mineral for dogs and cats, still available. Do you know how many supplements there are for dogs and cats right now? A zillion. Yeah, thousands and thousands. And then we have the number one doctor on the planet, Dr. Google, that as powerful of a tool that it is, it is also leading to a tremendous amount of confusion. Mm. And people are confused. Veterinarians are confused. What do I do? Should I choose this supplement? What about that supplement? And, you know, I have people coming to our practice with a box of 25 supplements and their dog is dying. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, the world has changed. We get it. You know, we get it. Especially with this um, cardiomyopathy fear that's been put out, even uh, though... 
we're a pet food store that doesn't sell kibble. So we, we're a kibble free store. And so we, you know, and mostly focused on raw. So we have some freeze dried and dehydrated and canned and cooked, but pri primarily we sell raw. And so people come in and they're all worried about cardiomyopathy and no raw was included in that. And they're automatically going, well, where's the taurine supplement? Where's the L-carnitine supplement? I'm like, these are meats. Yeah, you know, it's just, there. I, I just don't understand the acceptance of that entire movement that started, you know, through the FDA, because there is nothing in grains that supports carnivore heart health. <laughs> nothing. So we have to for another reason why this is statistically verified. It's just and insanity it's just these you know it's it's the you have to look at the other garbage that's in these grain based foods and or look at the the garbage in the grain free diets mm -hmm. that are causing the cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. it's not the absence of grains that leads to cardiomyopathy it's like give me a break would you yeah it's so, true and so, so one of our interviews was with Dr. Ian Billinghurst, and I think he came up around the same time as you, maybe even a few years ahead of you. Um, and so, so his perspective was out of Australia. So he, I think, uh, came upon raw earlier because we, they hadn't had the pet food movement that North America had had in regards to the industrialization of pet foods. And so, um, at what point did you come on Fresh Foods? I did, first of all, I love that man. <laughs> Likewise. I, I, I had the honor and the great fortune to lecture with him when I ran into you up in Saskatoon. That's right. And I actually feared him because we got interviewed after that. And his comment about me is, I, my only regret is I didn't know Marty decades before this. And then when they asked me my opinion, I said, I actually feared him because I've always questioned authority. And he was the authority. And my life was so crazy, I never really had time to look into his works way back then. I stumbled upon healthy diet through my own health failing going on to a more, you know, healthy, raw diet, and then trying it on animals because, it, you know, it just made sense. So I just winged it myself. He, to me, is and was the authority. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have just invited him to contribute to my next book, and he did. And, yeah, he just wrote, he's right, he wrote one incredible vignette that's going in the food chapter. And it's just great. And then uh, I also invited him to do another little 500 word vignette into my cancer chapter. Awesome. Awesome. He's fantastic. And his new book on cancer is exceptional. Beyond exceptional. It's mind blowing. It really is. And, yeah. and, and it has to do with not just dogs or cats. It has to do with all mammals. It's exceptionally well done. Yeah. And it only goes back 2 billion years ago on this planet Earth. <laughs> It's a trip. I mean, I was blown away by his, you know, he got a standing ovation for me when he lectured in Canada. Yeah, Boy, I was I there. That <laughs> That's it. And so, so, so you, and what was that? Was that in the 90s or the, the 80s? That seven. you, in the 70s, eh? Wow. Oh, way back when I was losing my own health coming out of vet school. Right. Just stressed and, um, working too hard and all those good well, things. Eating crap, but also genetically based. You know, like all the males on my mother's side of the family I took care of, most of them are gone from this planet. And those that are still here, the few, uh, had all the same illnesses that I also genetically inherited that I happened to turn around through nutrition. I'm right. healthy now in my 70s than I was in my 20s. You're one of the healthiest men I've ever met. Yeah, and I still, I'm still not there yet because I'm having a good time in life. But, you know, I, my oldest daughter is 18. My young, I'm 58 years older than my youngest daughter. So I have to stay healthy. You're better. Yeah, exactly. You're better. 
That's great. And so, uh, so what's next with the doc, dog doc? You're going to do some more festivals. Is it going to go into more general release or like, uh, how long is that going to last? Do you, do you have, I guess, even any insight into that? Yeah, if you go on dogdocthefilm.com, you can see the trailer and you'll cry during the one minute trailer and you'll see a listing of the the remaining festivals. I know they're talking about one being done in Vermont in early February. Okay. Canada. Well, then I'm going to have to write our local film commission and then write you guys and see if I can get it to come here. Yeah, you contact Cedar Creek Productions. Okay. Because I, I, I don't have much to do with that. I was just yeah. the talent. Yeah. And then it's most likely going to come out in distribution end of February and early March, mm-hmm. either DVD hopefully movie houses across North America. That would be awesome. Just like her last movie, Buck, did. That's awesome. That, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'm excited for it. And I'm excited that you got the opportunity to, be, to make it. Yeah, and it was just, it was funny, but it was filmed during maybe one of the most stressful times of my career and my life. And it doesn't show in the movie, but it was just... <laughs> It was, just, it was just amazing how it panned out. And you have no control because it's a documentary of what you're going to film. Mm. And she didn't take any past stories to film. So we would start with a pet, you know, coming in fresh. And you don't know the outcome. You know, mm. we, we have no prediction on it. But it, it just, it really did come out extremely well. I've seen it 10 times already. And each time I get as much cheers. Go on Hollywood Reporter. Okay. And read their review. The awesome. Hollywood Reporter, that's the biggie that everyone waited for. Read it. Actually, if you read their review, you don't have to watch the film. That's how concise and comprehensive the Hollywood Reporter's review of this movie was. Fantastic. Now, back to food, because really that's what we're here to talk about, you know. Um, uh, So for me, um, we see a lot of strange things come in the store. And right now in the fresh food community, there's a uh, a meme uh, is what I call it. But it's an idea um, that has grasped the community. And so we get a lot of people asking about 80-10-10. And, um, you know, 80% muscle, 10% bones, 10% organs. Now, for me, in my head, I imagine what would a rabbit look like if it was 80% muscle, 10% bone, and 10%. It would be a strange-looking rabbit. But what do you think of 80-10-10? My definition of the science in the field of medicine is man trying to figure out what nature already laid down. Right. So as technologically advanced as we become, you know, with the biochemical pathways and all these MRIs, you know, showing the blood vessel circulation and the tumors where they're growing and this and that, you know, nature already laid all of that stuff down. Nature laid down the the metabolic pathways. And, you know, it's astounding that we're able to figure it out, but it's already there. So when you start to do configuration, 80, 10, 10, you know, when I went to Cornell, I had a three-week course on nutrition, and it was all mathematics and arithmetics. Mm. It was all percentages of digestible protein, fats, and this and that. It had nothing to do with quality. Statistics. And the other thing, too, is even though I'm – helping bring this out there. I'm not a big fan of the totally balanced meal. Right. Because in nature, they didn't eat that. Nature will figure it out. You know, one of the ways I really saved my life when I started to do all of this is I ate nothing but brown rice for about two to three weeks. That's not a balanced meal. My arthritis went away. Uh, I was always fat and I lost 20 pounds. You know, I tried dieting for years. And then I did a seven, nine and 11 day fast on either juice or distilled water. 
Mm-hmm. And I got so unbelievably healthy, but distilled water is not a balanced meal. And I still, I would have gone further than, uh, than 11 or 13 days. It's just that I, would, I got so thin, my, my mother was having a heart attack. You know, I, I've had friends do a 30 and 40 day fast on distilled water. And they became so healthy. So we have to watch out about this concept of the complete nutritionally balanced meal. So 80, 10, 10, 78, 12, 8, who cares? (laughs) You know, you get it approximate, they're going to do fine. Nature's going to figure it out. Yeah. When to give this supplement, you know, it has to be uh, 40 minutes before the first meal. Who cares? Get it into the body. Nature will figure it out. So, yeah. So I've always said, if the pet food industry was created by scientists who studied the way dogs and cats would eat in nature, we would have never created pet food to become what it had become. Mm-hmm. So if the pet food's industry was created by science by common sense instead of science we'd be a heck of a lot better right now you know i've witnessed the incidence of cancer at least quadruple in dogs since i graduated cornell so take this science and get rid of it because something is wrong with that statistic yeah period yeah yeah i i i I have to say i mean one of the things that caused us to want to do these you know, capturing information for our small audience um, in these interviews was the fact that I learned that dogs die of cancer more than every other mammal on the planet. Yep. Yeah, great study that was done in 2015. And I actually, I presented that chart, that graph in my lecture, and it had mammalian cancer. And everything below 50 cents with 50% was these blue dots of all the other species. And then all of a sudden, the red dots were all the different species. Uh, I mean, all the different uh, types of dogs. You know, the, this, oh, the, 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 this the, and that. Yeah. And they were all way above the other mammals. Yeah. And it's like, so why? Bad luck? God is striking the canine population? No, God wouldn't do that because spell God backwards and what do you get? Dog. Chances are, chances are that's not what it is. Yeah, it's, chances are it's, it's not, not, what it's it not is. divine intervention. It's not science applied to the field of health. Well, and I think that uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Billinghurst, his thing was that uh, the complete and balanced is a razor's edge of nutrition rather than a natural road of nutrition where you have room to change lanes and move around and get variety and change things up rather than this razor's edge of nutrition where you better eat the same thing every day because we're making sure that only this fine edge is being met and you have to ride that razor. Absolutely. He, he, uh, he, he phrases it very well when it comes to that. <laughs> He, he, nutrition was his gig for many years. He was really yeah. good, really good at it. Now with this right. cancer, so um, so with your new book and you're do, getting into some of the spiritual or the ultimately, I think the way that uh, dogs and cats or pets um, affect us in a in a, a greater sense, as well as the way we affect them in a greater sense, because our energy really affects our pets. And vice versa. I mean, here's the problem. I mean, the human race has a whole bunch of activities it does every day. And these activities go into, let's call them different dynamics. You know, you, you work on yourself, try to keep yourself looking good and healthy. And then you have the family unit. And then you have the unit of groups that function together. And then you got mankind Notice where the animal and vegetable kingdom exist. You know, the animal kingdom represents to the human race that energy flow of unconditional love, happiness. They're always wagging their tail. They always bring you joy. And unfortunately, we've turned that dynamic into cancer. So we are crashing spiritually the human race. Do you know how many people I've dealt with 
that stopped work, stopped doing their movies, stopped doing their shows, stopped doing the this is the, the that's because their dog or their cat w- was terminally ill mm. or the, the mood that you go into when your pet is diagnosed with terminal cancer, let alone your child. So yeah, we are spiritually, you know, I care so much more about the animal race than the human race, but we're also destroying the human race by our ignorance on healthcare in this profession. Yeah. Well, it's strange, you know, and you see this quite predominantly in, in pets, but I see it in humans as well, where we have a healthcare system that doesn't care about nutrition and we have right. a nutrition system that doesn't really care about health. Hello, science. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and hello, pharmaceutical companies. On top of that. Yeah, they kind of run the show, unfortunately. You know, and I'm, I'm not ad- adverse to conventional medicine because I still have to use it every single day. Mm-hmm. I don't go in that direction. But, you know, you, you look at, at how, how much our industry is subsidized by the pharmaceutical industry it, it gets a bit scary. You look at these commercials on primetime TV and it's just, you know, the absurdity of the 15 seconds on the benefit of the drugs and then the 35 seconds on what the drug will do to you. You know, you will be really happy if you don't commit suicide. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just... And you you read these you listen to these commercials and how would anyone buy that drug of this bizarre name? But they sell billions every day. They do. Yeah. So it's it's just you know we time for change. Well, we see we see it in our store where people come in and they say how they have allergies and we talk about that what that means and then they say you know this is what's going on and it's itchiness and it's this and it's the skin and the and then. Almost always, sadly, it's, it, it's not allergies. It's the flea treatment. That stuff is being oversold because it was created to create, you know, when you had an infestation of fleas, not a flea, or never even seeing a flea and just putting it on or putting it in their mouth every three months. What the heck is going on there? Well, here's the... The profession of veterinary medicine is a disease-oriented establishment. We learn as veterinarians to diagnose disease and then drug it, the three Ds. But unfortunately, we have learned to try to prevent disease with elements that cause disease. Vaccines do not make dogs and cats or people healthy. They protect against disease, but they now have a huge list of adverse reactions. Heartworm preventative, that does not make a dog healthy. It prevents against a disease, but look at the label on the adverse reactions and it's like watching these TV shows we just talked about. So flea control products don't make dogs and cats healthy. They protect against flea infestation, but they themselves have a list of adverse reactions. So we become disease oriented. We are doing things to protect against disease. So we have created disease. Yeah. We don't learn as veterinary students much about health care. Right. Right. It's disease care. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's, uh, it's just strange to me that, that, if I, if I went to the vet and said my, my kid does, or the doctor and I said my kid doesn't like mosquitoes and he said, here, let me put this pesticide on his head. Don't touch him for a couple days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we do do that. We go to the picnics and put DEET on. Yeah. That's pretty toxic stuff. Yeah. And then you have the new revolution, which could be more influential than anything else. Glyphosate. Mm. Oh, I mean, I think that's destroying the earth, the human race, and the animal kingdom. Well, it's brought to you by the same company that brought you Agent Orange. Yeah, and this wonderful (laughs) 
substance when I started doing all this work that preserved fat in pet food, that was the Monsanto rubber stabilizer to re- stabilize the rubber in, in tires called ethoxyquin. Yeah, it used and it in blew dogs livers out. It liquefied their liver. Oh. Horrible. And it was mandated to be used in fish meal. It probably still is. It probably still is, you know, depending on the test. It doesn't, make it on the, doesn't make it on the label because it sneaks in the back door. Right, because they didn't put it in the fish meal. They got the fish meal as a product that already had other ingredients that I don't need to list. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a crazy system. Uh, so do you, do you know anything about what's going on with AFCO right now and some of the craziness that's happening there? No, I've always, you know, even though we've abided by AFCO in trying to create high-grade foods because, I mean, they're, they're not really the regulatory board. They, they're the ones that lay down the principles so mm-hmm. the FDA could regulate, which they don't do it. Uh, but I, I've kind of stayed away from that. You know, people... The thing I've always advised when people ask me after I speak and after they read my book and this and that is, how do you fight this stuff? And my answer to that is, you don't fight it. You know, if you walk into a room that's pitch black and dark, don't try to fight the dark. Turn on a light. So anytime some of this blackness, I don't focus on the blackness. I keep on working, you know, it's the old thing. If you're on a fire truck and you're going, you're driving to put out the fire, don't stop the truck to kick the barking dogs off the truck that are attacking it because, and there are a lot of barking dogs out there in the field of disease and healthcare. So personally, I just keep on working on the truth, the light and health. I love that. You got such a great message, Marty. Thank you. Yeah, no, you really do. Every time I've spoken with you, I've, we've met a couple times, once in Saskatoon, most recently, um, and then once at Super Zoo. Super Zoo, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was hoping to see you there. Didn't see you, but I was hoping to see you. Very appropriate name for that. <laughs> it really is. It really is. And uh, um, I go every couple of years. And... Um, um, Every time I see see you, every time I speak with you, you always have such a positive message. And I love this message of, you know, don't focus on the what's wrong, fo- focus on being right. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's just, it's so simple. You know, you just walk the path, talk, talk the talk that you've learned to talk. Yeah, you stick know, to your values. I mean, it's becoming rewarding finally after, you know, we're talking about four decades yeah. of going against a huge grain. Huge. And now I'm just, you know, it, 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 I'm just really happy. And it's, you know, not about me. You, it's hard to make me happier in life. It's about the animals that we love so, so much and so well. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a food out now. It's a freeze dried food. We even get it up here in Canada called Dr. Marty's. Uh, and yeah, I'm very, very happy with that. Uh, if I had to go ideal, I probably wouldn't have created a freeze-dried food. Yep. But the process of freeze-drying really doesn't degradate anything. It just removes the moisture, preserves everything. And it was uh, my way of being able to reach the masses. Mm-hmm. Because you start to ship raw diet, and you're dealing with refrigeration, and the weight of the moisture you, 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 you put yourself out of business and the freeze dry. That's what I do, Marty. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, the freeze dried process and the joy about that food right now and its associated supplements is the testimonials I'm getting through the company forwarded to me and the videos of families with their pets thanking me for saving their dog's life and it's just like that's what it's about for me and it it just just i'm actually getting contacted by conventional veterinarians who've had cases non-responsive 
and they, the people bought my food, and within two weeks, their dog was normal. And the veterinarians are contacting me. So there is the win-win for me in my life. Yeah. And it's yeah. amazing the difference food can make. Oh, absolutely. Because people come into our store and I'm like, you know, it's just food. It's not drugs. You know, let's not expect, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow. But then they come in a week later and it's like, it's a new dog. I'm like. It's that easy. <laughs> Health. I wrote in my, you know, I wrote 17 fundamentals in my first book. You know, fundamentals of, of health and disease. And one of the fundamentals is health is simplistic. Disease brings in complexity. Mm -hmm. The medical establishment may be the most complex profession on this planet. Where health, how do you heal a cut? Sign mm -hmm. on to Google? You cut yourself, how do you heal it? Look it up in an encyclopedia? No. no. Now, it, if your immune system is healthy, it will heal. So disease is, or is this um, amassment of complexity where health is simple. Food, it all begins, it all starts with food. Yeah, it's, all, it's, it's a lot of get out of the way. Yeah, that's let, it. Let the body do what it needs to do, but you, then you need to give the right fuel. Right, oh, you, you need to know what... And, you know, besides just feeling that you have to be right in the field of arithmetics and science, it's okay for everyone listening out there to use common sense. Yeah. Think about it. That's what woke me up. It's not so common anymore, though, is it? Nah. Not, it's, well, I'll tell you one thing. It's not on the curriculum in medical school. <laughs> That's the truth. So, so we see a, a huge explosion, especially here in Canada and I expect the Pacific Northwest in CBD products for pets. Oh boy. Have you, have you seen the same in your own practice? No, I see it on the internet. Yeah. You know, three to five a day. You know, we do use it in our practice. We had the fortunate experience talking about when I lectured with Ian in Canada, you met Dr. Uh, Silver. Having Rob Silver yeah. lecture on the science behind CBD. He's great. And, oh, he yeah, he's contributing to my book too. <laughs> awesome. And it's just you know there is so much science behind the efficacy of using a natural product called CBD and all its constituents. So you know it, it's just a, another step in the right direction. When I lectured at the Cornell Veterinary College that got filmed for the documentary, and I went through the timeline of when I graduated and how my license was verbally threatened in 1978 for treating arthritic dogs with glucosamine sulfate because I wasn't using acceptable medical therapy. I threw that timeline on, and then I put up a study done on the pain and inflammation relief of arthritic dogs mm -hmm. that was done two months before I lectured at Cornell. And guess who did and published that study? Dr. Silver? Cornell University Vet School. Oh, awesome. So I just then looked at the audience and said, don't you think it's time to wake up? <laughs> and the students, they just loved it. And you'll see part of that in the documentary. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that must have been a great experience to be able to get, go back to your alma mater and, um, and give a talk and, and inspire those youth. Not only that, but it really looks like the documentary will be showing in the future at the Cornell Vet School. How exciting. Very. Yeah, you must be very proud. That's awesome. It, it's not pride. It's a feeling of not so much even accomplishment. Mm. It's just enhanced well-being for our favorite kingdom. You know, when, when people, you know, how does it feel to be a rock star? Right. What? <laughs> how does it feel to have this work? And this is the work of nature, not me. Get accepted so we could better our, our favorite companion animal kingdom. That's what it's about. It's not about being a rock star. 
<laughs> I haven't changed. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just about finally having the acceptance of what needs to be done, get done. Awesome. Period. Yeah, no, awesome. I think that you're, you're building a great legacy, Marty. I think you're doing great work, and um, we need more vets like you. Oh, we're going to get them. <laughs> Mark my words, because it is the new. First of all, when I went to Cornell, it was 60 students, a maximum of two females in a class of 60. How's that? That's crazy. That's how it was. And now, do you realize that? Across the board, in the veterinary colleges of the United States, it's probably at least 70% female in mm -hmm. all the classes. Mm -hmm. So you have that heart entering the profession. And you know what? They want this. And as the resistance eventually retires and or dies off, mm -hmm. this is going to happen in our profession. Well, what do they say? There's a, there's a saying that scientific advancement happens one death at a time. Yeah, there it is, right? <laughs> and, you know, and we, we kind of do need that. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, the, and ge generations move forward um, with a better perspective. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, what's next? You do so much. What's next? Music. Oh, yeah? I love it. Yeah, as much as I love the animals and I love the work I've been doing, and not to be sacrilegious, but I have to say that music is a little bit more important to me. And right. I've kind of given it up. You know, I can sing, sing well, and play the guitar. I, you know, I have 1,700 LPs, 1,300 CDs. At one time, I had 4,445s. And I am a music fanatic. Awesome. And I haven't really done any of it. So as, you know, I finally do get out of clinical practice so I could educate the masses. Yep. The book is done. And I know the food and the, the products are out there. I will finally have time to spend with my family, my daughters, and really get into music because I love music. So that's one of the things that's next. I love it, man. I, I think that's what I said. When, when I get to close to retirement, I want to take a, a course on uh, audio engineering because I have a lot of friends who are musicians and I, they need a good engineer. So I figure I, that's a, there's a free MIT course on audio engineering I've wanted. Cool. To. Yeah, and it's, it's just another, you know, aesthetic, artistic vibration, which yeah. is the vibration that the animals function on, not the human race. So it's the part of us that gets into a higher vibrational energy. And also, I want to see the world. Yeah. I've been a slave to work for 45, 47 years. Yeah. And, you know, Europe, Egypt, I do. There's a lot of world I want to see. So, you know, travel. And also, when I travel, learn more about the medical practices in these more down-to-earth countries the european countries south american countries so that's on the horizon that's awesome that's exciting very so i i think that um if you were to talk to somebody today who had never um considered uh, a fresh food diet for their pet so you know they'd only done the conventional you know nestle therapy as i like to call it where they're just feeding the same bag for the, the lifetime of that animal um, and riding, as Billinger says, that the razor's edge of nutrition. And they're considering, they come into my store, we don't sell kibble, what would you say to them? Well, once again, if, you know, the line I always use, if the, if the pet food that you're feeding your dog or cat was created by scientists that studied the way a dog or cat would eat, they wouldn't have created that. Or what Martha allowed me to say the first or second time she had me on her TV show, she allowed me to put up the formula of maybe the most popular selling food in the United States. And the first ingredient was corn. And she allowed me, obviously the name of the company wasn't on there. Yep. 
but she allowed me to look at her and say, Martha, have you ever seen a dog stalk an ear of corn? And there it is. So it's just really, you know, my advice to these people, use common sense, become educated, and read labels. Yeah. And think about the ingredients you're seeing on that label and if that is conducive commonsensically for your dog and your or your cat, you know, to eat. The cat's the obligate carnivore. Yep. The other thing I should just say is show me a one tooth in a dog or a cat's mouth that is flat for grinding or chewing cereal or grain. Yep. Period. Yeah, and then uh, um, and with cats, I, I was on the board for an organization called FelineNutrition.org, and um, uh, all the vets on that board said they they legally shouldn't be allowed to sell dry food anymore for cats. It, the science shows clearly that that's harmful. There's no health in that. They shouldn't be allowed to do it. Um, uh, what do you think? How many cats have you seen with kidney disease? And it's not the kidney disease. It's the creation of cardiomyopathy, which the pet food industry has publicly taken responsibility for mm -hmm. you know, and destroying all the taurine by there's no meat in there whatever it, it may have a little bit of taurine gets destroyed in the heating process now it's illegal to put out a cat food without it so mm -hmm. you know it's more it's more the heart disease than the kidney disease but then it's cancer diabetes obesity allergies yeah. all of it and it's a hundred percent yes the cat is the obligate carnivore. It's the meat eater. Yeah. Feed them meat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we wrap it up on that note? Feed them meat. Right? And Sounds you know what? It's funny, but Oprah, when she had me on, she squeezed me into another show because we had the, what I, I titled The Day the Music Died, the Pet Food Recall. Yes, that's what started my career. 2007. Yeah, that's what started my store. That was it, 2007. And she squeezed me into an already existing show. And I was only on for four and a half minutes. And she chanted as she was making food for her dogs and Sophie, meat. Dr. Marty says, let them eat meat. <laughs> and then that was it. It said, thank you, Oprah. <laughs> That is awesome. I love it. I love it. It's a perfect note to end on. And, and uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us your time today. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. And you're doing great work. You know, just open some stores down in this country. Well, yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to take over Canada first. All right. All right. You got a mission. We'll allow you another year. Thanks so much, Marty. All right. A pleasure.